Yeah, so our esteemed guest for this week is Norbert Wilson. Uh, Norbert and I have known each other for a few years. This is a picture of me, I think, probably 60 pounds lighter. Um, so that would translate to probably six years ago, uh, <laughs> where we were in Greece. Uh, we, we actually got to, to do uh, an experimental auctions workshop together, I had a fantastic time. Um, this is a, I, fo I stole this photo from Ortega's uh, Facebook page. Um, but we learned a lot there. And uh, at that point in time, Norbert was at Auburn University. He had just graduated uh, a few years prior from uh, uh, Davis. So he's another one of these Davis fancy people. A few years. You've been out forever, uh, haven't you, Norbert? Yeah, I was like, thank you, but I graduated <laughs> in 99. <laughs> oh. <laughs> As I said, I'm almost 50. <laughs> You're young at heart. We, we had just hiked like a, a multiple hour trip here. Um, we, there was one moment where we almost got stuck on a beach together. If you remember, we were coming back down and then all of a sudden the boat was leaving and they, we, didn't, we weren't on the boat. Um, so that was the whole thing. Uh, but it was a great trip. Uh, so since then, Norbert joined Tufts University and he's been at Tufts for a few years. Three years. Three years. And uh, so now, as of, I guess, this summer, you're making the transition to Duke University, correct? That's correct. Yeah. Um, you're also uh, on the AAEA Board of Directors. I believe you're rotating off, though. Is that right? Or where? I am. I think officially I'm no longer. Well, it depends okay. on. I, I was at my last board meeting. Okay. Well, so AAEA makes no sense for the next, like, few weeks just because everybody's doing their online meetings and stuff and it's all kind of everywhere. Yeah. Um, but you also uh, published a piece and you've been working a lot on, on this uh, food loss and food waste topic uh, during coronavirus. So I think I pointed this, uh, this cast uh, special issue out a couple times now. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's a pretty helpful, helpful resource. It was actually cited in uh, national geographic a couple weeks ago. Um, but yes. the, uh, um, this it's it's on the economic impacts of COVID-19. Um, they're all kind of popular press type written articles, so people can really understand what's going on there. Um, but this piece, food loss and, and waste in the United States during COVID-19, was written by Norbert, Brent Ellison, Brandon McFadden, and Brad Rickard. Um, I'd say it's kind of an all-star cast uh, for for people who are working on this topic. So um, I know you're also submitting a couple other articles on this exact same topic. So you, you've been really focusing on kind of food waste during coronavirus for some time now. I'm happy to talk about this because it's the food waste concept isn't a concept that I've totally wrapped my mind around as an economic concept. So I'm hoping he can educate me for the next 50 minutes. Yeah, well, in, you know, what we've been talking about is, is this kind of storyline about imports and exports, especially in meat markets. Uh, you know, you've had this constraint of supply chains, uh, while at the same time, you know, there in like April-ish, people were talking about record exports to China on pork. Um, if you'll notice here, we've seen a, a decrease in exports to China over the last uh, month or so. Uh, and so, you know, it's, there's an interesting story there about trade. Um, Norbert probably knows more about trade than, than I do. So, uh, you know, he, he's covering that, but I think what I'd really like for us to focus on more than the trade piece of this story is the way that consumers have changed their consume, their behavior uh, in the United States and what that's done to, to food consumption, especially on the food loss, food waste side. Uh, so this is, uh, um, the USDA puts out something called Charts of Note, uh, where they'll, they'll post charts that have, I think, kind of interesting economic stories behind them. Uh, this is the one that they ran just this morning. Uh, the, the big story I pointed out before that in March, uh, year over year, food away from home consumption dropped by 51%. Um, and uh, so we've seen that kind of uptick a little bit. So uh, year over year, if we're comparing um, May in 2019 to May 2020, uh, there's been a 37% decline in, uh, in consumption away from home. So, you know, it's not 51%, but it's still bad. Um, it's still a completely different economic market. Um, and, and obviously that's going to have some type of an effect on, on how we're eating and how we're um, efficiently consuming the calories that we grow in the United States and in the world more broadly. Um, so that's why we brought Norbert in. He's, he knows way more about this stuff than we do. 
I don't even know if Alex thinks food waste exists. Um, so, I tried to say that a lot more tactfully a second ago. Thanks, Trey. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, Norbert, thanks for joining us. Um, first and foremost, I guess I'll let you introduce what you've been working on. Sure. Um, so, hi, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I've enjoyed having the conversation with Alex and, and Trey, and uh, I, I hope I can um, at least provide some, some insight. Um, this is a project, if, if, I, if, if I'll just focus on the project, uh, that I've been kind of kicking around with uh, Brad Rickard and Brenna um, Ellison and Brandy McFadden for the last several months. And, and you know, I, I will say um, we were interested in looking at some issues around food waste. Um, and um, we, this is before we knew COVID-19 was going to happen. If we had known, obviously, the world would be different. Um, but we, we, we were trying to get a survey out, um, and we were going to do this four-wave survey. Um, and by the time we got everything kind of settled, we uh, distributed the, the survey, I think it was like the same day as uh, when President Trump announced the national emergency for COVID. And we thought, at my first thought was, oh, man, this is going to totally mess up what we're trying to do. Mm. And then realized, oh, Oh, we might be able to say something about how consumers are responding to COVID. And, and so this has been an enlightening um, experience. I, I wasn't sure what people actually do the survey, knowing that lives were really in upheaval and, and everybody was in these really complicated situations. But we found that that people really did engage the survey. Um, I've got to give credit to um, IRB at Tufts to be really, really responsive to making changes when when we started to realize that we could ask some questions about COVID um, and we went through appropriate channels to, to get that done. And I got to say, it, that was a concern. Like, you know, how, how, do we, how do we do this in this context? Um, are people too stressed or too bothered by what's going on around us? Um, so anyhow, we, we were able to get this out. Um, I got to say, my colleagues um, are, are, have just been wonderful to work with. Um, it's been great to interact with them, to learn from them. Um, they all offer something really unique. And um, if, if you are working on your own, let me discourage you from doing that and find good <laughs> colleagues that you can work with because holy moly, I could not have done this work on my own. So I'm really appreciative of, of everything they've done. Um, I do have a couple of slides here that I can show about some of the work. Um, we have a piece that's under review um, uh, right now. We're working on another piece. And so this is a, um, an image that came out. Um, this was about March 12th or so. Um, I think we had just gotten a call that our daughter school was going to be closing down. And so we went grocery shopping at a, a local shop um, in, in, the, in Somerville, Massachusetts, which is outside of Cambridge and Boston. And I must admit, I had a bit of a heart stop when I walked around the grocery stores. And I've traveled other places in the in the world and I had never seen anything like this and you know my wife had to look at me and say okay it's gonna be okay you can breathe breathe we're gonna be all right because <laughs> I was not in a good place when I started to say what is going on I'd seen images on the news but this this kind of took my breath um and it made me wonder what was really happening um and actually it's kind of interesting to see some of the data that corresponds to what we see here so so I think um, there's you can go ahead and let's see what the next slide tells us so um, this is a, a um, what we did in this survey we asked um, we started with a sample of about 4,400 people knowing that we would lose people through attrition so we ended up with about a thousand three hundred folks um, at the end of the fourth round um, the rounds were basically every two weeks so about March 13th to the end of April is when our data uh, from the time from which our data come and um, we asked we used a validated scale that came from NHANES uh, the National Health uh, Examination Study and they had this thing on um, food uh, purchases um, sort of food acquisition and they asked people um, in that survey and we adapted it for our online survey um, tell us how much money you're spending uh, on food items and non-food items at grocery stores. And that was one category, and that's our, our um, top line there. And then tell us how much you're spending, and I only look at the food items here, um, how much you're spending on uh, food at um, corner stores, bodegas, um, uh, dollar stores, what have you. Um, that's the, the line with the, the black boxes. And then... Uh, how much money are you spending on food at restaurants, sort of in dining restaurants? 
and then also takeout and delivery. And so as you can see, there was a little bit of a dip. Um, and now this starts at the beginning of the pandemic. So we may be picking up a point when people were really going out and buying because we asked about the last month, the, you know, the last 30 days from that date that you were completing the survey. So we did this over the four week, over the four runs. And what you can see is there was a slight dip in uh, food purchasing at grocery stores, but then there was a slight increase at the end. The, the graph doesn't tell us exactly, or it's hard to see, but you can see in, um, when you look at the waves or the rounds statistically that there is a change um, and there is a, a bit of an uptick. Um, and corner stores, it's interesting how that has a slight um, increase and a kind of a dip and then another increase. But the, the bigger story is food away from home, particularly food eaten, uh, eaten at the restaurant. Um, so um, eating out is what it's called. And you can see this really sharp drop from $40 a week to basically zero by the end of the, the fourth round, where the eating out, uh, excuse me, carrying out, um, I, which I didn't appreciate because of where I was living, um, you know, you see this real significant increase. And so people were making some shifts. So, so this was a, one of the things that was fascinating to observe as we, we watched the data come in. And then particularly as we look back after the data, and, and get this analysis. And so um, if that paper comes through, you'll, you'll be able to see some more details about that. But this was a really striking finding to see how consumer behavior was shifting. Um, I, if I remember correctly, I think food away from home went from, the, the ratio of food away from home and food at home uh, went from something like uh, 60, 40, uh, no, more like closer to 50, 50. Now this is a sample of folks to something like 70, 30. So, I mean, it was a huge shift in how people were eating um, and where they were getting food. Well, this, so this, I, I, I really appreciate that there's four categories here because one of my big complaints for a while now is when you look at figures like this and you have food away from home and food at home, um, you know, you might've picked up the food needed at home and that counts as food away from home, but you didn't make it yourself. So it's not food at home, like a grocery store, um, you know, and, and the idea that people, especially when we start talking about nutrition, uh, you know, food at home, if we're talking about food at home being uh, grocery stores, well, corner stores count for food at home, um, yeah. correct? I, yeah. I, so, so like what, you could buy a lot of things at a corner store that might not necessarily count as food at home, um, you know, that, yeah. so, so like you're, you're missing the way that people eat by just trying to focus on these two lines where there's, there's much more nuance to the story, I think, in how we consume food. That's exactly right. And, and um, it, it's interesting. I was on a, uh, another webinar um, with Sean and Sean was making the point because you mentioned nutrition, Sean Cash, I'm sorry, um, who's at Tufts University, um, a, a colleague and, and, um, and uh, economist friend. Um, one of the things that he, he talks about is just because people are eating more food at home and they're cooking more, that's not a guarantee that they're eating more nutritionally. Um, and, you know, the amount of baking and, and showing off on, on Instagram of their new bread or new cake that they've made is maybe not a good sign that nutrition has improved. So, mm. so I, I think there's some real interesting questions to understand. When we made this shift, how did we eat? Um, and there's been some evidence, and I've been in some other conversations where people were concerned about uh, using uh, comfort foods because, again, just because you went to the grocery store doesn't mean you were eating um, uh, fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, I, I don't know how Captain Crunch has fared during this time, but I got a feeling the captain has done well. <laughs> so. Well, the processed foods are, are through the roof. I mean, if you look at, like, sales of uh... – um, anything that's canned right now, it's it's all up at record highs or record increases at least. Um, so I can imagine. I can imagine. I'm just brainstorming, but I can imagine that impact of of nutrition content hits children the hardest uh, because they were originally going to schools where they were served these meals. Now they're at home and their parents are working full time and they don't have that luxury to spend that time cooking. So, yeah, Captain Crunch is what we're getting. Well, yeah. and, and you know, at, the, at the elementary schools, you know, they, they have pretty stringent regulations on what counts as like a, a healthy meal mm -hmm. where, I mean, mm -hmm. I, last night for dinner, I had a bag of Lay's Dorito chips. So I, I can imagine that if I'm, that's how I'm eating. I think a lot of people are eating similar. <laughs> that's right. That's right. And, and it is a challenge. I mean, the fact that we're home with our kids, so this is more anecdotal, not real data. Um, 
other than my own family's experience. And so I won't speak about my nine-year-old daughter, but let, let's just say it has been a challenge to, to make sure she's, uh, what, you know, thinking about what, what kinds of food she's eating and how to make sure we're bringing in good things. But the fact is they're not in the normal schedules. And so it's really a challenge as a parent. And I'm sure any other parent out there knows it's been, uh, it's been difficult to, to encourage um, healthy eating and when you can, because we're there and, it's easy to just kind of snack. So um, uh, uh, ego depletion has occurred. I'll, I'll just say that. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Oh, he's going to talk about it. Cool. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, um, so thanks for moving there. Um, I was actually trying to pull up uh, one of my, uh, some of the, the, the actual statistical analysis. And so one of the things that we did was, this was a question that we were able to add um, related to COVID. Um, and so what we asked was, given what people, uh, given what you normally buy, how have you bought or more or less of these various food products because of COVID? And, and this was over the last week. And so the top line represents dry staples. So that's rice and pasta and, and, and flour. And you can see, and this, there is a statistically significant increase. And this is a, a scale that went from zero to five. Um, or one to five, excuse me. And so you can see if it was above three that you bought more of it. And so generally people were buying more of these dry staples. There was actually an uptick in round two, which is at the end of March. So indicating that there was a bit of an increase. And we saw the same hold up for eggs. But um, you can see in terms of whether or not people were buying frozen uh, vegetables, which is the third line, you can see it, it really didn't change over the three rounds. I actually was surprised by that. I thought people were sort of stocking up on frozen vegetables, at least at my local grocery store they were, but it didn't play out. Um, we looked at also canned meat and there seemed to be a little variation, but it wasn't statistically significant. And by canned meat, that was including, that's short for you know things like tuna and um, spam and other products. So maybe this is a reflection of who participated in this survey then so much uh, the broader uh, society. One of the things that did surprise me was the, um, how people didn't buy salad greens, and then particularly how salad greens dropped in, in the round three in terms of people even bought less of those. And so one of the things that we were wondering about, and, and this is something that um, we, the group we wrote in our cast piece, and then we kind of think a little bit about in the, the paper that's on the review is, were people stock, uh, uh, develop your engage, excuse me, engaging in stock, uh, stocking behavior, and that's what the sort of dry staples suggest. Um, and that they were trying to avoid perishable products like the, the, the salad green. But the one place I thought people might have bought more of and, and it didn't show up was the shelf-stable milk. So, so we were broad in what that could be. That could be plant-based or animal-based uh, milk. And we see this real drop um, in, in shelf-stable products. So I thought, that, you know, especially in the beginning when we were really concerned about the stockouts and what people were doing, I think quickly on, um, people realized who were willing to buy that product said, mm, maybe this is okay, at least in this sample. So, so we see a, di a diminution in, in sort of the interest or at least people stating that they have bought that shelf-stable milk um, as the pandemic went on and people started getting some sense of things were going to be okay in terms of what was available at the grocery store. Dude, I got, so, a, so I, I, was, I got a stupid yeah. question though, which is okay. really stupid. Shelf-stable milk is just fluid milk, right? It's just regular milk. No, no, no. It's like, uh, and so we were clear about uh, the, the UHT, the, the packaged milk that you would find on the, on the, on the, not in the refrigerator section, but on the, on the, in, on the shelf. Okay. And, and the, yeah. the scale over here says um, the frequency of purchase relative to like pre pandemic. Is that what I'm, no, no. how I'm interpreting this? So a three is yes. I haven't changed this and a two is I've reduced this expenditure? That's right. Okay. That's cool. right. So if it's, if it's above a three, if you said three, if it's average at three, you're saying I bought about the same as I did before COVID-19. If it's above three, you're saying I bought, if it was a four, it was I bought a little bit more. If it's five, I bought much more. Um, and so you can see people were, if you will, buying more of the dried staples and eggs um, during this time. And, and much less of the dry, or excuse me, the shelf-stable milk and the um, salad green. If I'm looking at this, like the ranking of items here, I'm I'm saying that everybody's filling up their bunker. Um, yeah. 
I, I mean, I think Larry on, on, he also said like, he's got a bunch of coconut milk now. Um, like I, I, I mean, and, and that's the shelf stable milk, but like, I mean, if you're going to fill up a bunker of things and you're like, I don't think I'm going to be coming out anytime soon, I'm going to buy all my dry staples. And then I'm going to think, okay, I need protein. Um, well, eggs hold a lot longer than all the other stuff that I can buy. Um, I'm a little surprised that, that frozen foods actually saw a little bit of a decrease um, relative yeah. to that three point frozen vegetables or yeah, sorry, frozen, frozen vegetables. Um, I would have expected that to be a little bit higher. Um, this is interesting. Same here. Yeah. And, and, you know, and, and I wonder, yeah, I wasn't clear on why we didn't see more of purchases of frozen vegetables. And I, I maybe it's a reflection of maybe people don't like frozen vegetables or, so it, it, I have, we have to be careful to think, well, did people just not want those products? And that may be part of the story as opposed to just stocking up. Um, so it, it, it was interesting. We do see some changes over the rounds. Um, again, a, a little bump up in the dried, um, the sort of products that people can hold on to and, and a definite drop in that salad green that was uh, surprising. Um, and I guess it just reflected the perishability and people uh, either were not interested in eating salads because of whatever reason, or maybe being afraid that they wouldn't get to consume all the salad in a timely fashion. Therefore, why buy it? And that, yeah. that raises the question of how food waste is going to really play out. Are we seeing people move away from some per more perishable products and like the salad greens example, and therefore we may see less waste in that area, but will we have a food waste issue later on in time because people stocked up on things that they're ultimately not going to really consume once we get past the pandemic. Um, I, I want to raise a point, and I know Alex has this in the back of his head, about whether or not there really is food waste. And, uh, <laughs> and that's okay. I don't, I don't have a problem with it. Um, you know, I think there's some real questions, and, and I've had lots of conversations with our colleagues to say, if I buy it, am I really wasting it if I don't ultimately consume it? Um, and, and, and that's one angle on that um, argument. Um, and I appreciate this this idea. Um, well, it's it's the, the I guess, neoclassical economist take, right? Like that's to to an economist, yeah. you're like, well, I bought it, so obviously I prefer it. So if I threw it away, well, I, it's my choice, you know. A Alex, what's your argument? Why why do you think that food waste doesn't exist? So can I just ask one question about this figure before we move on to that? Sure. Uh, just because I'm like OCD and I can't stop focusing on this thing. So my first just thought about the frozen vegetables reduction, I wonder about the fact that we are constrained in our ability to store stuff. And so we only have so much freezer space. And so some of that freezer space was being taken up by frozen vegetables. All of a sudden, if we're storing a whole bunch Good. of stuff, something's got to go. And so I think you could you could make that argument about some substitution there with a, a storage constraint. Did you ask about that, meats? That is a, uh, not fresh. No, no. The only thing we came close to was the canned product. Um, yeah, we didn't touch meat, but that would have been an interesting thing. And um, why didn't I talk to you, Trey? Why? Why didn't I talk to you? So. <laughs> well, I I just know for a fact that I I bought an insane amount of meat as soon as I started seeing that these plants were starting to shut down, which yeah. that means I know that makes me part of the problem, but, uh, I, I really wanted to be able to eat my poultry, uh, you know, so yeah. <laughs> I mean, ground the, beef the was, was going off the, off the shelves like crazy. Um, and, and I yeah. think in large part it's because people were storing it in their freezers. Um, That's it, right. it was, it, it took forever to be able to find freezers like that. I mean, there were stockouts at Best yeah. Buys and everywhere at Home Depots didn't have freezers for people to buy because they, they were constrained by the storage side. I, I don't know. I think it's interesting. I, I think that is interesting. And so I was doing, um, and it's still under development. I, 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 so I'm, I'm going to show my hand as an economist who's doing now work with um, people who do qualitative research. And so we've been interviewing folks who um, were um, participating in, in what are called micro pantries. You might have seen these. Um, they're like the little free libraries, but oh, the um, fridge. They're putting books in. I'm sorry. The fridge. Um, free. Sure if, I haven't heard that term. Free yeah. fridge. I, uh, yes, I think it's it's a similar it's a similar idea. That's right. Yeah, and and so it was one of the things listening to individuals who were using these as a way of su supplementing their 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 diets because. 
of loss of job and, and, and difficulty getting out um, and that the food pantry system wasn't working for them because if they were working, they couldn't go at hours that made sense for them. All that's to say, I, I remember talking to one person where they really were struggling with accessing meat. Um, and and th this was really important mm -hmm. to them. And they were traveling several, I mean, like hours just to find a store to, to identify a place that had meat. Um, wow. Maybe it wasn't hours. I want to be careful. I want to over exaggerate. <laughs> but they like were a long way. That, they were driving a good distance. Days so and days and days. <laughs> they, I mean, they went on, but but it was but it was it was interesting how this was a really important thing, and where I had the impression this person may not have had the ability to freeze, and therefore was looking for like, how do I do this? How do I? This is important to me. I want to get this. Um, but I, I appreciate Alex your your comment about the frozen uh, vegetables and yeah I Trey I wish we had thought about um, uh, meat um, and at the time we didn't really realize that there was going to be a a, a run on meat um, as yeah. it ultimately showed up in, in the weeks afterwards so just but just, Alex I'm intrigued to hear your thoughts on food waste okay let's do that I had one more question I wanted to ask about that but you're right I have this beat the economics show, of this figure to, to death. <laughs> No, I want to talk about food waste. I've, Let's I've, do it. I've heard enough. Okay. Um, Just my, my random thoughts about his figure. Okay, so here's my, here's my story. People forget food. People buy insurance, and every, every month they pay um, some money for that insurance in case something bad happens. Uh, and if something bad happens, they get, they get some kind of windfall or protection as a result of that right? But essentially, if they, um, if nothing bad happens that month, that premium disappears, right? It, they've essentially thrown that money away. I think the same argument could be made, or actually, I, I am making the same argument in terms of food waste, that it operates as a sort of insurance on your food consumption, that in any given amount of time, say there's a global pandemic, and you're saying, holy cow, I see these grocery store shelves disappearing. I don't know what life's going to look like tomorrow. From my perspective, it's a rational thing to overpurchase as a way to protect yourself from those future risks. If it comes out that you didn't need uh, some of that stuff and it was ended up being thrown away, that is something that you have made a rational valuation decision and you have chosen to um, let your premium disappear. There you go. There's my neoclassical argument. Um, yeah. That and, being said, I, I haven't you. thought much about food waste. No, no, that's okay. And I've, I've, I mean, I have been in conversations where people will push back on it. And at no point would I say food waste is necessarily irrational, but I don't argue that point. Um, but of course, there are no... Uh, I, I hope I'm right in saying this. I don't think there are externalities if I don't use my insurance premium, um, but there are externalities if there is food that, that just the, the fact that the, 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 uh, this organic material decays and that there are, there are consequences of that. Uh, so in that sense, there is something else going on there. Um, and, and I think food waste, and I've been trying to think about this um, in a different way, I wonder how much is it like uh, gym membership? You buy this gym membership um, and you don't use it all because you only go once after the, the new year and then you're burning this membership or you don't go during the months that you're supposed to go. I'm not speaking of my own personal life. <laughs> so so I, I just wonder if that's a, a useful parallel where it is money that you're, you're, you say you're going to do this thing, you want the benefits of it, but you don't realize the benefits. I think that might be another way of thinking about it, which is a slightly different way of thinking about the insurance because it's, the, the consequences of not having uh, insurance are so much greater. And then of course there is the space of, in some places where there's a, a real legal implication of not having insurance. Um, so, so anyway, I hear you, don't get me wrong. I, I think there's a lot to think about in this. Um, and just because it's not, um, just because it, it even if it were rational, there are implications of product that is being produced. Um, so I, I would just can you raise can that. you give me those externalities? I'm interested to hear the externality story. Yeah. So one of the things, and and this comes out of uh, sort of thinking about the whole supply chain, where 
part of the reason that we know that there is some product that goes to waste. Um, so on the farmer side, uh, a grower is making a decision to, this is on the food loss side, um, uh, this farmer is going to produce product, but if the market turns where the price goes down, that farmer with its fresh fruits and vegetables, they plow under the field. Uh, you know, you could say, well, that was a rational choice. They weren't going to make money. They were going to cause a loss in harvesting that product. Therefore, boom, that's not a problem. But the resources that went into the production of that product it does reflect some loss that happened. Something we missed out on something, and that if could have been if the timing could have been planned differently, those are resources that could have been used in another way. Obviously, we can't know that for a fact. I mean, we can't plan perfectly, but that's part of the challenge I think we run into. But that issue runs throughout. So another reason we see food loss, so I'm going on that and I'm gonna hit up to the consumer side in a moment. When we think about marketing, if a farmer grows a product that doesn't quite meet marketing standards, it could easily be tossed. Um, it may show up in sort of the charitable food sector, um, but it may be tossed. And again, there were resources, there were labor inputs that went into it, and that's a loss. I would imagine that that's not always a good thing. And the, the energy, the uh, environmental consequences of that are not zero. Uh, so thinking through that and understanding that and mitigating that loss could be beneficial. So then on the consumer side, that is uh, if you overbuy food um, and you end up not consuming it where you could have actually better managed the food that came into your house. And I want to be careful. I'm not trying to blame people for poor management, but you can have products that go to waste because you weren't managing the resources in your refrigerator. Um, could you have spent that money differently? Would you have spent that money differently? Just like buying that gym membership that you ultimately don't use. So those are some of the things that I think about when I look at this. Um, yeah, I, that, that's the way I would, uh, I've been thinking about this. Would love to so hear pushback or I, challenges to that. So I, I don't think food waste is an irrational thing. I think it's an inefficient thing. Um, and that's those those are two different conversations. Um, you know, I, I think it's rational to even buy a, a gym membership, even if you could have saved money by buying one per trip. You know, there's a pre-commitment component to saying I bought a gym membership. So now I have to get my money's worth of the gym membership. So I've committed to going to the gym and I probably am going to go to the gym more light more often um, because I bought into the gym as opposed to, um, you know, me buying per trip. Um, so Similarly, if I'm buying healthy food and keeping it in my refrigerator, I think I've increased the probability that I'm going to eat healthier food in my refrigerator as opposed to going to the McDonald's to pick up a bunch of food. So it's, it's less efficient, but it actually might be perfectly rational to, to create that pre-commitment by buying food that you're going to end up not eating. So actually, Norbert is the smarter one. So Norbert can answer that and then I'll continue to argue at him. <laughs> I, I I appreciate Trey's comments because I, I think I, I again I didn't I have not approached this as a, a concern about irrationality, um, but rather it is a, a question about efficiency. I will say when I've interacted with other researchers outside of sort of the economics realm, um, their concern has been very much on the environmental consequences of mm -hmm. um, the the production of product and and the waste disposal and the and the environmental implications of that. Um, so, so that would be that. And I actually thought about it in terms of just resource use. Um, could I have spent my money differently? And yeah, we probably could have, you know, when you buy that big tray of strawberries and you end up not eating it. I mean, that's a small thing. Um, but you know, gosh, how many times am I doing that? Um, so anyhow, that would be the way I, I, that's the way I've thought about this issue. Um, and I, I find it kind of interesting how, so some of the work I've been doing on date labels, uh, how date labels are shaping the way people approach a product. Mm. People will throw out a perfectly fine product just because the date is posted one way. And even just the language has, uh, I have evidence from some experiments and, and actually this, this work here was a part of a larger survey where we were looking at how people respond differentially to the date labels. And so we're seeing there's a difference in whether or not someone said that they'll throw away a product just because it said best of used by versus used by. And so for those reasons, you know, I think there's something there. In my family, we used to have a purge every year. We'd go through the cabinets and say, oh, that's past the date. We got to get rid of it. It was a canned product. I'm not going to say, I want to be careful here because I'm not a food scientist. Um, you know, that, that, 
jar of spaghetti sauce that's a day past the date that's posted is probably okay. Don't quote me on it. Don't get botulism by eating something you shouldn't. I'm just saying in my family, we've actually kind of, we've slowed the way we've looked at, at that information and we've thought about it um, a little bit more. And I mean, and I can honestly say my wife and I would have real debates about, well, it says Best Buy. Well, that must mean, or it says used by, well, that must mean where those labels, there was no federal regulation for those. Um, and they were ones that retailers or, excuse me, food manufacturers had decided on. And so now there's an effort to sort of harmonize that system um, on the industry side. Um, so there's an interesting question there to see if, if it's not irrational, but maybe it's inefficient, um, but why are people responding differentially to just a little, a few words um, so, and throwing away a product that's perfectly fine. Can I ask about the inefficiency component? Because I'm, I'm, I, I find your, your externality story most compelling. Uh, and I'm hoping you can talk about that in a second. Um, I guess first I would say, I wish you had come to my grandmother's house to do that purge because every time we would go and visit her, there were some scary Best Buy labels from like, 1965 so if only you could have done a better job <laughs> alex let me say i wasn't going to touch i wouldn't have eaten those but <laughs> i mean if you can scoop the mold of off of it it's fine it's <laughs> but, the, but so, I, so. I remember living i remember seeing people like when i i mean that wasn't something my family would have done but i remember living with other people or being in other settings and they're like just take the mold off i was like oh my gosh but you know, so, so yeah <laughs> I, i've heard of crazy stories of stuff opening up like 20 30 years later and it's perfectly fine i am not doing that good i'm choice. just saying i'm not doing it but let me I, let me let me ask you about the inefficiency argument sure. i have a hard time with this for a couple reasons and the, okay. the first reason is that a lot of those quality size, quality grade standards are put in place um, as a way to exploit market power, as you know, right? If we can restrict the supply that enters the market, we're able to drive up the price and increase our profit margins. So there's one mm -hmm. component uh, as a way that the industry is doing this from a profit maximizing perspective. A second is, sure. um, if there are some farmers that are able to um, produce um, with less food waste than others, and so therefore are more efficient, um, I feel like over the long term, just with any other inefficiency we've got, we're going to drive those less sure. efficient producers yeah. out of the market. So I, uh, I'm not totally convinced on either of those. So I guess I'm going to well, ask you like yeah. a nine part question, <laughs> which is one. Okay, I feel like you... I'm in a prelim. <laughs> <laughs> One, can you tell me why I'm wrong about that? But two, I want to hear more about the size of that externality, the environmental externality relative, I guess, to other externalities. What's the size of that of that problem? Uh, so I'll answer the second question first. Um, I don't know. I, to be, just to be fair, I, I have not done that kind of work to think about the external, the size of the externality. And that is a valid question. If it's not that big, then maybe this isn't a real issue. But if what we're doing is producing to the point that we are, and I, I'm careful about using language of, um, I can hear Dan Sumner in the back of my head. He was a major professor saying, you can't over, there's no such thing as oversupply. It's, it's just the supply. But, but this, and I hope I'm, I'm quoting him correctly. Um, Dan, forgive me if I missed up. Uh, um, you know, it's been, anyway, I won't go there. Uh, the point <laughs> is um, this idea of, you know, you can still hear your major professor's voice in your head. Um, the point I'm trying to get to is that if there is production that is, um, it's one thing if you're producing so that you're making sure that you can meet the market. That's, I understand that. Um, but the question is, are you expending resources using fertilizer? Are you using water in a place that's already scarce in, use, uh, in water availability? to produce something that ultimately won't make it to market, then I, I think that's a, a concern. To what extent, how big that is, that's a, that's, a, that's a valid question. And I think there's some good work that could be done to, to explore that. Because once we know that there is an, a, a use of, of pesticides or water that are beyond what was necessary, then I think we have to think of that. Um, and forgive me, I've forgotten the, oh, the, the efficiency, I, I agree that, as, a grower that is able to to minimize the waste 
as best as possible is going to stay in the market longer than someone who's less efficient. And I get that. And so I'm not going to argue against you on that. Um, but part of that story is the market shifts and so growers are having to make adjustments and uh, how that works out can be complicated. I would add one other thing. I get your point on the producer side that if you're able to use marketing orders or uh, market structures to assure a higher price, there is a, a other side of this. And I'm careful about making a big argument about um, food access and, and food security when it comes to food waste. I think people can get into trouble trying to link the two too directly. I think there's some connections, but I, I'm really careful about how we talk about that. But if what we end up doing is we price um, fruits and vegetables up at a price just because of marketing orders to assure, you know, um, a higher price, who's paying that higher price and what are the implications of that? I, I get it. We want to make sure that there are growers who are able to, you know, meet the, the um, to survive and do well in the marketplace, but there is a cost on the other side. So yeah, I think it's, um, it, it sounds like, Alex, there's a lot to be done there. Um, and to be honest, most of my work has been on the consumer side and whether or not consumers were throwing away products uh, based on some information that's printed on the product. But I, I see these implications all the way throughout the supply chain. Um, if you're really interested in this, um, there was a report that ERS did back in, that was published um, December, or I can't remember, it, was, it ended up being December 2019, or January 2020, um, and there was a book um, that um, several of us were engaged in that was looking at food waste and food loss, actually was looking specifically at food loss from the farm gate all the way up to the consumer, looking at the various factors and trying to provide some economic understanding of why we see some product that ultimately don't make, doesn't make it to the market. And I think that is one where we're not trying to say this is irrational. We were never making that argument. We, we were just saying that there can be things in place that lead to this behavior where some product ultimately is not used for its intended purpose, which was for human consumption. And so, so I think there's, there's a lot there. Um, a lot of really smart people did work on this and thought about the modeling uh, on one side to actually doing case studies of specific commodities and seeing how the industry responds. And, and so there's been some work that actually shows there's some pretty wide dif um, differences in product that ultimately makes it to the market. So I, I would just encourage um, you look at that. Travis Minor, um, uh, Susan Thornsbury and Ashok uh, Mishra uh, were the editors of the book and um, several folks like Tim Richards and, and Brian Rowe and Brenna Ellison and others were um, in the in the book and also in the um, the ERS report that came out. So, okay, I, I, I get the story that we're trying to stitch here that it's like a like from the farm gate to the fork. This is the food waste we're trying to measure. But like so I, I've been out to lunch and dinners, I think Schaefer, you were with me once, where a, a dairy producer will order basically all the butter. Um, and they won't use the butter, but they'll order all the butter and then have it thrown away uh, just because they feel like they're doing their tiny part to increase demand for the dairy products. Um, and Re so- Supply kind of, yeah. Well, I'm yeah, I mean, they're just gonna throw it away, yeah. Um, and And that's, waste but you know who loses there well you know restricting supply is going to increase the price of the consumer at some level uh it's going to also increase the demand for dairy products um on the front end is at least in this small case um and that's a that's a waste that i think this inefficiency argument you can chase through and it does have these implications for food security because you're increasing uh the cost of the product by this inefficient demand mm -hmm. So I was trying to throw Norbert, I was, I was, and you, you hit it. I was trying to throw you a softball with the market power story. The fact that market power is a classically bad thing, right? This is, you can say it's not an inefficiency. It's a market power thing. Market power is a bad thing, uh, which you, which you rightly said, yeah, it drives up consumer prices and who's burdened Depends by that. Depends on which side of the market you're on. Oh, well, fair enough. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> right. I am not by any means advocating market power. <laughs> no stress in imagination. Unless it's my market power, I'll take all the market power. So, um, okay, so we've got a, a few more minutes and I wanna get to what you're finding about food waste in, uh, in coronavirus land. Uh, Schaefer says when I say coronavirus land, it makes it sound like I'm talking about like Six Flags. A fun but, theme park, coronavirus yeah, land. Uh, so 
okay so this is your online shopping um that's interesting in and of itself actually i really think yeah. that relates to the to the yeah. salad story the fact that when when i want to buy my own salad i want to look at it to make sure it's fresh and not nasty and when we're purchasing stuff online i don't get to look at it and make sure it's fresh and not nasty so i don't buy the salad anymore that's that's an interesting argument and i i i, I can buy that i i find there's something compelling there I will say because of COVID, um, I was living in Boston when it all started. Um, you know, we were really under pretty strict orders in the city of Somerville. If you were out um, without a mask, it was a $300 fine. I mean, it was pretty, pretty tight. So I, there were weeks I hadn't left the house um, during that, during those early days. And so we ultimately used things like Instacart and other means um, to get access to food. And we were really hesitant. We were like, this is not going to work. I was pleasantly surprised. It, it, we had a really good experience. But I do believe that this rise may be reflecting, um, this, this increase is also reflecting, um, like you said, it may reflect people's concern about what kinds of foods that they buy. So when, one of the things that we were not able to get at perfectly, I mean, we kind of hint at it, but I wonder, did we, would, was there a significant shift in some of the foods that they were buying because they were using online grocery shopping? And that, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, I will say, as you, you might know, that SNAP, uh, there were pilots and then there were some extensions of these um, to use online shopping where SNAP was available on, online. And so, so that is something I, I, I will be intrigued to see. I think once we are past the COVID-19, I pray to God that that happens someday sooner um, as opposed to later. But I wonder how the retail sector will look differently after this. Um, how much more will we depend? Because I've gotten kind of comfortable not going to the grocery store. Sure. I'm kind of loving that. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I think there's some in interesting implications and in, um, what we eat and how we eat um, will, will potentially change drastically. Oh. Wait, so were you, you were going to fix and tie the online grocery store to uh, food waste or is that still to come? Are we getting there? Um, I'm not sure. I, I was, let's, let's just move on to this one. And I'll do what you're doing, so. man. Sorry. <laughs> okay, sorry. All right. Okay. Um, this is, this is one last little um, slide. And so again, going back to in Haynes and actually some others have done the questions like this. Um, uh, Jason and, um, Brigerman have done a, uh, Jason Lusk and Br Lusk and Br Brigerman have a paper on food values. Uh, there's a group out of Washington, D.C. called IFIC, the International Food Information Council. And they've done, they do, IFIC does the study every year where they ask people what are important factors when you go grocery shopping. And so we did this. And there's actually, a, a, going back to Inhames, there's a set of questions that they use that ask similar questions. So we're not exactly matching. We're matching what Inhames has done, but others have done slight variations of this question. And so the thing that typically comes out as most important is how important taste is and how important price. Um, and so what you can see here is that taste is by far clearly um, the thing that really matters. Um, Uh-oh. Doesn't this I say lost? storages? Yeah, storage. I've lost my taste variable. Holy moly. <laughs> I, I actually uh, taste this at the very top. Um, okay. And so it, it's, a, it's above the others. So long and short, taste people were always looking for taste. Taste didn't change in terms of whether or not people thought that was important when they went shopping. But price actually ended up not being as um, strong or as robust. And actually, if you look at the statistical analysis by waves or, or by rounds, that the price actually declined in its importance over the, the four rounds, mm. which sort of surprised me that people yeah. were like, uh, I'm not worried about the price as much. I'm actually concerned about some other things and the thing that stayed constant and held at a point that a lot of times i haven't really seen and i'm going to be careful i don't want to say that storage was never or how long the food would last was never a point um, in other studies but in this one what we're able to see is that it held constant and there was no diminution i mean actually there was a slight uptick in the second round which is at the end of march early april where people said that it was a little bit more important on the five point scale than it had been in the first wave, uh, the first round. So, so there was something important to see there. Nutrition actually had a slight diminution. Um, it is clearly, excuse me, less important than the other factors. Um, and it actually was even a little less than round three. 
Um, and then ease of preparation just never was as important as the other factors. And so, so the fact that people were looking for taste and they wanted to make sure taste was maintained, and I'm so sorry that I somehow cut that off in this slide, um, is one of the things that really struck me uh, in, in this work. Are you, do you have demographic information for these people? So are you able to tell whether they did lose their job or whether they're collecting the $600 uh, additional unemployment stuff? Yeah, no, actually we do have some demographics. We had their salary at the point of the, the first round, um, but we unfortunately didn't have the uh, wherewithal to, to include the question of, did you lose your job or did you see uh, a change in your income um, during the course of the, the survey. Um, there is some conversation about possibly doing a, a fifth round and seeing if, uh, you know, and that, going back and asking a question like that and seeing if we can chart that. Um, but that's easy um, if we can do that. So yeah, that, I think there would be something really interesting. I would say that there is some data, there are data out there. Um, Raj Chetty um, at Harvard has collected and has made publicly available data on COVID. Um, one on sort of COVID cases and COVID deaths, but he also has this really rich data set about where people were spending money. Um, and there's some really powerful results where you look at um, right before the $600 dispersal and then right, after, right before and right after and what happened during the opening and then the closing of, the, of, of markets. And so, so that I think there's some interesting things. And one of the things we'd like to be able to do is merge our data with some of his data because we actually really know cool. Um, we were able to get zip codes. We, through IRB approval, we were able to ask for zip codes. And so hopefully we can link this back to where people were and what experiences that they had. That hasn't happened yet, but I would love to be able to get into and see, can we see some of these effects? Really I, cool, man. I, I, yeah, I mean, that's, that's the thing that I'm really curious about because, you know, there, there's kind of two ways you can imagine food waste going during coronavirus is you could see an increase in coronavirus because everybody was hoarding food or buying a like you know their stockpiles and then they didn't eat all the stockpile um or you could see the opposite where the prices went up and you know so there would be maybe a decrease in food waste because people were being smarter about the foods that they actually eat and and probably that variation matters a lot based on income uh and that budget constraint for your food dollar um yeah so i, I I, and and honestly, that's probably the the big story to me about a lot of this coronavirus stuff is for those of us that can afford to hoard our food and fill our deep freezes. I mean, it was uncomfortable and inconvenient, but you know, I just ended up having to throw away a few more loaves of bread. Um, you know, where where there are plenty of people out there that they literally can't afford to play that game, um, w right. whether it be storage or dollars. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, I, I mean, depending on your household, um, your ability to actually store food. I mean, when um, engaging folks from uh, lower income households, and obviously there's a lot of diversity there, uh, but it, it can be a challenge whether or not you have the resources to actually do a good job of storing food and, and storage space and, and what have you. And so depending on living arrangements and, what, uh, and other conditions, you can run into some real issues. Um, I will tell you one thing that I didn't show you in this um, and that we're actually doing some analysis for this now is that one of the things, and again, we were originally looking at this, thinking about food waste, and we have this survey question where we uh, give people a, a, a couple of products and we asked them, tell us how much you're willing to pay for this product. Um, and we realized it, it is a survey. So, you know, we did the, the best that we could do given that setting. But we also asked how much of this product do you think you're going to consume? And so one of the things that we're looking at is actually seeing how people's response changed over the course of the, 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 the four rounds of this survey. And to see, did people think differently about their consumption of these products? In essence, was there a difference in the food waste? And so... So that's under that's under analysis right now. We're we're trying to get to that um, um, actually as we speak. So so I'd be intrigued to see what ultimately shows up there. As you can imagine, trying to really measure food waste in the, a direct way gets really complicated. It's super difficult. Um, we're not doing the dumpster diving, going in and following people's <laughs> trash and to see what shows up there. Um, and I'm you know and 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 there have been work uh, there has been work rather that people have tried to get people to put products into a, a trash can, a special trash can to measure their organics. And 
and, you know, there, there can be some challenges of that. If, if you're consciously seeing what goes in, it may affect your behavior. So, sure. so the best way you've been able to do is ask, you know, so how much do you think you'll consume of this product? And one of the things that's been really striking to me is people, you know, we know that people might overestimate how much they eat or will consume and not waste. But what's interesting is that we do see people who say, no, you know what, I'm not going to eat all of that product. There is some product that I will throw away. And they may not say I'll throw away, but they know, they know that they're not going to consume it. And, and so, and some of the experiments I've run, um, originally with Brad and then with my colleague, um, um, Reeking, um, uh, Meow at, um, at Auburn, we were able to um, see that this, this result occurs, that people were willing to not consume all of the product. And it's not that it went from zero to 100%, but they were saying that I've consumed 70 or 80%. And so in our future analysis with the data set that we've collected, we're going to look at that a little bit more to see, are people adjusting how they're going to consume these products over time? And hopefully connect it with uh, COVID more directly than just which week of the survey you completed it. Well, really cool, cool man. I think we're, I think we're at time. It is. So yeah, I am, I am less skeptical Norbert than I was before this about the food waste issue. Alex, you can tell me anything. It's okay. <laughs> I, I'm, I, I can, I can, I, I appreciate that. I don't mind if people have questions about it. I mean, trust me. I, uh, I, so I, I gave a presentation of, about this at UC Davis and and I've, I've had some of those conversations of like, mm, is there really food waste? Um, but I, I think the, the idea that at least in that one section where changing information, change how people thought about the product, there is something important to think about there. Um, and so I'm open to, to having that conversation um, and think about what the resource use is. So I appreciate you guys doing this work. Oh, I'm sorry, Trey. I, I mean, I, honestly, I... It's such an economist statement to be like, oh, there's no such thing as food waste. Because, like, I mean, you drive through any city in America and there's going to be that billboard up that says, like, you know, all this food is wasted and stuff. And I, I always think, like, that number can't be right. Um, so, like, I don't buy that number. But the idea that there is zero food waste seems also a little bit crazy. It, no, no, no. It's, it's the concept of food waste. If that is an issue – it's not whether there is food that is thrown away. It's whether the concept of ish, uh, food waste is a bad that needs Concern. fixing. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. show you the market failure. Hey, That's I, the story. I, I I think there is a, a lot to be considered here, and I you know what I'm I'm gonna say um, having watched the video, so I'm I'm gonna talk about the two of you. One, I think you do a great job with this, and and this may not show up in the final uh, analysis, but you do a great job. I'm so appreciative of of uh, seeing economists uh, trying to engage issues that are interesting and and communicate in a way that anybody could watch. So good on you folks. I really do appreciate what you're trying to accomplish. I just encourage you to keep bringing in new and interesting and diverse people to talk about all that we touch on because I think um, our profession does a pretty good job of looking at a lot of issues. And yeah, there are folks who will roll their eyes at what economists have to say, but at the end of the day, I think we have a, a tool that can be useful. And so good on you folks. Good on you. Oh, we appreciate you joining us. Thanks, yeah, man. thanks so much, man. And hey, good luck at Duke. It. All the best, y'all. See you guys. Adios.